Hello and welcome to the Hardy Brain, the show that takes athletic, introverted entrepreneurs and leaders and transforms them into ironclad brain performers. I'm your host, Dr. David Hardy. And today on our show, we've got another amazing guest. He is a chiropractic neurologist who sees a diverse population ranging from children with developmental and learning problems to adults suffering from vertigo, migraines, concussions, tremors, brain injuries, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, kind of the full range. He is also one of my mentors and is probably one of the best teachers when it comes to functional neurology out there. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mike Powell. How are you doing today? Thank you, David. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Looking forward to chatting with you a bit here. Yeah, absolutely. So how long have you been a chiropractor for? And then how many years on top with the functional neurology? So 28, 29 years, uh, right in there. I, the first time I ever uh, taught to a, a professional audience uh, on neurology, on clinical neurology, was in January of 1998. And uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing it since then. So um, hopefully I'm getting a little better at it. <laughs> well, when I met you, oh, geez, roughly, what was it? Uh, oh, a decade and a half ago now, I think. Uh, yeah, you were teaching one of the courses in, in Atlanta. And I had had other instructors in functional neurology and seen clinical cases with some of the doctors there. And I was just blown away by your presence and how you made things make sense. Like you were taking these complex topics and just blending it together. Um, where did that all kind of start that you developed all these skills, this knowledge, this wisdom, and, and more so how you can apply it to a, a person struggling right in front of you? Sure, sure. So, yeah, I, you know, I, when, I, uh, when I got, I went to college initially to get into healthcare. Didn't want to borrow more money and spend more years, so I used that sort of pre-healthcare training and got a biology degree in coaching, and I taught and coached uh, high school. And uh, so, you know, th there was some teaching there, and uh, I knew I wanted to go back to school, and so I did. And I went, I went to chiropractic college, obviously, and and um, and then really very, very soon after that, was asked to start teaching some neurology, and I know that. For me personally, uh, uh, complex concepts, how the brain works, that's a little complex, how cells work, all, all that type of human physiology, human anatomy, it never really meant a whole lot to me just by itself. But when it was, man, I've got this person that I'm seeing in my clinic and they've got this issue going on that they're really struggling with and I really, really want to help them then all that stuff becomes really, really important to me. And so that was, you know, through clinical stuff in school and, and, and in practice, certainly and continues to be to this day, sort of the rock in my shoe that makes those things important enough to me that I really want to understand that. Maybe if I understand that, and over the years, I see lots and lots of patients referred by other really great healthcare providers that for whatever reason, the patient's not doing as well as they had hoped or as well as that provider had hoped. And they're seeing lots of different people. So I need to try to look at them with fresh eyes and a little different perspective. So I, I, I mean, I try to incorporate that into my mindset. And when, when I teach, I figure it's a room full of people like me. That's, that's what I do. And <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, there's, there's probably not a whole lot of rooms. There's probably very, very few rooms where I'm the smartest guy in the room. That would be an, that would be a very unusual room. So I probably translate pretty complicated things that somehow I've gotten my teeth into in ways that I think um, a lot of, you know, very, very talented people in the room um, can, get their, can get their arms around, even though the, comp the concepts are kind of complex. So um, something like that. I love it. Now, let's go into a very complex topic and that is how do we boil down what functional neurology is in just kind of a, a few lines to make it make sense because we're dealing with a very 
complex uh, set of tools and integration in the, in this world that isn't quite known yet. Sure. So when, it, you know, it's all clinical to me, it's all, it doesn't make much difference to me at all unless it's something that can help somebody else. So the way I look at functional neurology is person has some aspect of their health that's not the way they want it to be. And in, in my world, in our world, doc, a lot of times that's vertigo or tremors or they had a stroke, whatever it is. They've got some kind of impairment and we know that it has something to do with how the brain's working, whether it's damaged or it's not working right. So functional neurology is just trying to understand how the brain works so that when it's not working right, maybe we can incorporate the principles that, it, that restore healthy function to that patient. And that's pretty general, but you know, if there's an area of the brain that's provoking seizure activity, if we could make those neurons healthier, there's something to be gained for that patient. If there's an area of neurons that have been physically damaged because a person had a stroke, but some of those neurons in the neighborhood survived, maybe not enough to get them to be able to move their arm or their leg, but you know, there's something there, getting them to be healthier and pick up, you know, pick up the job a little bit more is probably gonna be helpful to that person. And you can apply that in pretty much any situation you can think of. You can apply that to really, really healthy people that just simply want to perform better. And and uh, a, a more optimal functioning brain is part of that. So, you know, what's not working well, what can we do to make it work better is really what functional neurology is all about. I love it. Now, you've seen a lot of patients and gotten quite a few people very, very much more <laughs> better functional and back into life and back into their sport, their game, their world. Uh, what are kind of some of the, the home runs you've hit that you're like, wow, this patient just, just was one of those people that, that responded so well to this. Sure. Well, I, I, yeah, well, you know, there's, there's lots of, lots of folks. Um, so it's, it's, it, so I teach a lot, as you know, David, and you've probably seen, well, you, you've actually, I think, met this patient. But the one that, you know, there's some people from a long time ago when I was really early in practice that I learned so much from that, like, every day I reflect on them because they helped me help somebody else. And uh, uh, there's a guy named Ralph, and I, I saw him early in practice. He had a hemorrhagic stroke that right. paralyzed the left side of his body. And uh, so the right side of his um, the right side of his brain was damaged um, with bleed. It paralyzed the left side of his body and really flattened his affect. The right side of your brain is where a lot of your emotional expression comes from. Not so much which words you select to say, but just the you know the the, the pep in them, the emotion in them, the the nonverbal, um, the non language part of that expression. Anyway, real flattened affect, you know. Not, not much there at all. And he had been uh, mostly inpatient for about a year, um, wow. stable enough to go home. And uh, his sister-in-law brought him in to see me. And I, I saw him a series of times. And uh, as we talked a moment ago, my top of mind for me was, you know, what areas of the brain aren't working as well as they should? Well, that's pretty obvious. You see it on the CAT scan. So irregardless of what expertise I had in my exam, there were some areas on the right side of the brain that control the left side of the body that I was hopeful maybe we could get some more function out of an impaired area and probably saw him eight, 10 times. Every time I saw him, nothing changed. He was just as paralyzed as it was the time, the last time I saw him. And uh, it was early enough along in my career. And I'd seen some pretty impressive things change in other people. And I, now I'm kind of like, I'm in a rut with this guy, you know, gosh, he had this hemorrhagic stroke over a year ago and I'm not getting his arm and his leg moving, which there was never really an expectation that I would, to be honest with you, from anybody else but me and probably his sister-in-law. She had that expectation, unreasonable expectation. And uh, one day in the office, I did the same things with him that I had done on the other visits. Um, some adjustments in on the side of the body, mostly that was impaired. So opposite the side of dysfunctional brain or damaged brain. And um, when he got, and he was doing exercises at home. 
when he, I had him sit back up and I had him try to move his arm and his leg the same way I had every other time before and after adjustments, before and after exercises when nothing ever, ever happened. And he just raised his arm up, kicked his leg out. And, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't able to like play the piano or anything, but he was able to raise his arm up when he couldn't even raise it an inch. You couldn't wow. anything. So and something just, just clicked in his brain and fired right there in front of you. Right. And so, you know, you know, my goodness, you know, that that's, that's some kind of miracle happened. Um, and what, what we know in all honesty and what I realized pretty quickly, and I, and I knew then too, I just didn't really know or have a good window in to see how it was happening, that there was probably some little gains going along the way week after week after week after week. And if this is the threshold you have to reach for some basic level of function, and let's say function means you can voluntarily move your arm and your leg, he was probably creeping closer to that over time. But if you don't reach it, nothing moves. And it looks the same as if everything uh, that would be um, wired into that arm and leg are dead. Um, And, uh, you know, we were probably, unbeknownst to me, pretty close to getting that to function. And it, it suddenly did then. Um, and so uh, that's that's pretty memorable. I have a little video of that too. That um, I'm pretty, ge- with Ralph's permission, I've been pretty generous about sharing when I teach because it's pretty impressive, and I reflect on it a lot. But um, but it, he's certainly one of the patients that um, over the years I I think about. You know, 25 years after that, I still think about him a lot when I'm looking at other folks, and and I'm and appreciative to. To him and to his sister-in-law, because she uh, she actually pushed me hard to get the most they could out of me as well. Right, yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so so that that would be one. Now, what about like the facial expressions? Like you mentioned, yeah, he had kind of this dulled affect on his face that, and I always kind of say it's like, yeah, they, like a lot of the life has been taken out of a person that mm-hmm. that the expression, the emotionality, the feelings just don't come across. It's it's dulled down a lot, and right. yeah, we we've both had the privilege of seeing that like instantaneous change in somebody. And so much of it is seeing like the life coming back in the eyes, the face as well. And you're just all automatically like, whoa, something just occurred there in that person right in front of me. Um, what was kind of the other aspects of, of this? Yeah, he's moving. Um, there's got to be a sense of joy in him now that he's gone from being paralyzed in one side and uh, being able to to feel that and and express it maybe. Yeah, and I think that I think it's kind of twofold. Um, one is, you know, areas on the right side of the brain that move the left side of the body. Well, some of some of those neighboring areas give you that emotional expression, and so if just the function of some of those areas on the in the right brain starts to come back. You know, you're going to get multiple functions probably come back. You know, was, that's not surprising. So he may have just simply had some areas come back online. And not only was he able to take the left side of his face, which his smile was crooked. I mean, I could ask him to smile. The right side would come up. The left side wouldn't. Um, but when his arm and leg started moving, both sides would come up. And when I would ask him about, you know, like, what, what do you want to do, you know, now that you're getting some function back? He had an answer for me before he had no answer. His sister-in-law had plenty of answers, but he didn't. Um, right. <laughs> and he, you know, he kind of looked like he didn't care. And so I think part of it is neuroanatomical, neurophysiologic areas working better. The other thing I think is hope and right. uh, independent of, you know, some spot in somebody's anatomy, in their neuroanatomy that's, that's reaching a threshold there's other areas that were probably not damaged at all by an injury or someone else you could consider like, you know, MS interfering with it, whatever it might be. But, you know, whatever, something about the interaction, something about something that they've experienced change that maybe they were at a point where they're going, you know what, this is never going to get any better. Or maybe they were told it's never going to get any better. Um, but that hope uh, that, and, and boy, when you actually, 
not just have a convincing conversation with somebody, an encouraging conversation, um, but when you actually see something change on yourself or you go, I thought that was dead. They, You're right. <laughs> you know, he told me, he actually told me that when he was in the hospital, that sometimes the staff referred to that as his dead side when his arm would fall off or the, um, not off his body, but his arm would just flop down. Right. He, and somebody had to physically move it. And he remembered that he, that was stuck in his head. And, and, uh, um, but I think, I think that hopefulness is huge, you know, and you know, I don't care what you're trying to accomplish in life. If it's kind of hard and we're talking about neurological disorders and one's health, but it doesn't matter what it is. If it's kind of hard, that stuff's kind of hard, but a lot of things are kind of hard. You got to have some hope. You got to have sort of a reason. You got to see value, whatever it is. And uh, when that's not present, the deck stacked against your health getting better, your, you know, whatever you want to achieve getting better, something you want to change, relationship, doesn't matter what it is. Um, you need that. You need that hope and you need to really buy into it. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool when you can see that change. All right. Um, in, in our patients. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But uh, yeah. What about the other side of the spectrum though? We've got people who've had damage and what about the side that just wants that extra performance? And yeah, maybe they are kind of stuck in that moment where they've kind of lost hope as well, or they're struggling. Um, there's all sorts of physical things, maybe not as uh, apparent as moving a, a paralyzed limb, but how do you get kind of these neurons firing physically or show physical progress, clarity or improvements in brain function with somebody who wants to perform at another level? Sure. So just as you said, when somebody's had a stroke and like the patient I described, it's pretty obvious. I mean, you could spot across the street that right. this gentleman in a wheelchair um, you know, it has, has severe disability. So in the vast majority of, of patients that present to our clinics, um, oftentimes it's not that obvious. And in a lot of people that are pretty healthy, you know, issues, issues that are keeping them from being not as close to hundred percent as they'd like to, you know, whatever they're 90%, whatever we throw some number out, we don't know, but everybody has uh, aspects of dysfunction and it can be quite subtle in really healthy people, but they know they're not performing optimally or, or as well as they could. So if we can bring those subtleties out somehow and show them to them and let them know, okay, we see this, 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 and this, and we know that if these yardsticks, I think of them as yardsticks, okay, if I, if I see these yardsticks changing for the better, then I know that your potential to perform better, live longer, do whatever, whatever the thing is that you want to be able to do, um, sleep better, whatever it is, the odds of that go up. But we have to make the subtle obvious. Sometimes, and we didn't, you know, we, we talked about the patient whose arm wouldn't move and doing things to try to stimulate the brain to, to make it so it works better. But a lot of times that stimulation doesn't work very good. If a person's blood sugar's off or their red blood cells right. are off or their thyroid's off. So some of those are just flat out numbers that that we take the time to look at through some lab testing. That's easy enough to show patients. Other things that, that we can see are with reflexes and some eye movements and some balance tests. And we can oftentimes make the subtle a little more obvious to us as clinicians, but also to the patient as well. And you say, hey. I got this list of six things. They add up to this circuitry and this aspect of your physiology could be better. I think if we could hit these marks, then you're pointed the way you want to, where you want to point, you know, whatever, whatever the aspect of their life they want different, that, at least in how it intersects with health. Um, I think that's how we do it. I think we got to make, we got to look closely. We got to somehow be able to record what may be somewhat subtle. And then make it obvious to the patient and let them know, hey, we've got goals here. And that's what we're going to be looking at as, as we move, move forward. And then finally, when you empower them with here's what you need to do, then I think they've got a why, they've got a want to, and it usually goes pretty well. Uh, yeah, it, it's one of the best approaches on earth. And uh, everybody jumps to tools. 
And obviously in functional neurology, we, we hate talking about tools until we talk about what's actually going on in the, the neurology first. Can you kind of speak to maybe a little bit of that frustration too, that everybody's jumping to this cure that they've read about or, oh, this is going to improve my brain function and they might not need it or it's the wrong thing for them. And well, how do we get that across to people? It's not about sure. the tools. It's about how your brain and physiology is working and then we can find tools. Sure. So uh, you're absolutely right. It is easy to jump on things. And, you know, there's a there's a constant demand for something new. So maybe right. the thing six months or two years ago really was super valuable, but still it's got a shelf life in our attention span. And we want something better or new or clickable or whatever it might be. So um so a couple things. I try to communicate what we just talked about a moment ago that um, we need we need a bullseye. So we need to look at you and, and find out what's what's unique to you in terms of what's not working as well as it should. So we look at brain function and we look at the physiology that supports that blood sugar, those types of things. Then we need to come up with a plan for you. If we've got those bullseyes, then there's lots of different ways we can go after them. I always think of the example, right. you know, you can hit a bullseye with an arrow, you can hit it with a dart, you can hit it with a rifle, doesn't matter. If you hit the bullseye and the, the yardsticks are improving, we're, we're getting better. The other part of that, David, and, and, and this is more a clinical thing, is after lots of years of not, probably not doing as good a job at this as I could, I mean, um, you know, I learned slowly through trial and error, but, uh, you know, I'm a clinician, so that's how I think about this stuff. Right. Yeah. I, I, I make it um, I make it a little bit difficult to work with me now, harder than it was 20 years ago. That's for sure, to try to help you perform better. So if you've got to jump through a whole bunch of hurdles to come see me or to some come see someone like yourself, then and I tell you, you know, you need to do this, this and this. You've already done a bunch of stuff that you probably didn't want to do. Um, right. Say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. And the most recent shiny thing doesn't mean that much to you then. You're like going, you know what? It was a big pain in the butt to go see this doctor, <laughs> Dr. Hardy or Dr. Powell or whoever it is. And when they tell me something, they, when, when they tell me what they want me to do, my answer is yes, even before they tell it to me, because I have a high level of commitment. So, you know, that's, I, I would suggest to people to work with someone like that. Find someone that, you know, for whatever reason, you think they're an expert in that field that requires a fairly high level of commitment. You know, and I, I think this, you know, you need, uh, you need accountability to somebody. And you also need, you know, anything that you do, you need accountability to somebody else. And you also, if you're trying to, you know, push the envelope on your performance. You're trying to, once again, try to make a change in your life or your health. That's kind of hard. It's probably going to be some trial and error. So even with a lot of expert advice, expert recommendations, it may not be all that perfect. I mean, you're in a difficult situation. The guy with the stroke, that's an unreasonable situation. There's a whole bunch of stuff that didn't work with him, you know, and, 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 you know, not everything worked perfectly after we had that pretty good day in my clinic. Um, but uh, so you need to work with someone you can be accountable to and also that can kind of steer you through little setbacks and kind of stay the course. So that's that's my two cents. That's my two cents on that. If you want to change something that matters, you need to you, you, you need to make yourself commit to someone else. Now, how do you do this with people that are maybe not too functional? Um, we do see people that are, well, have dementia or Parkinson's, which are pretty late diagnosed diseases and the, the disease process is, is, is happening. Um, so maybe the family or the caregivers are more involved in this as well. Um, what's kind of the buy-in process with these? And then too, how do you kind of explain hope with someone who's who knows that their loved one's deteriorating and, and sure. pretty far gone. Sure. 
a couple things. And uh, certainly one is that we know that um, at least some of the misfolded protein accumulation that occurs with Alzheimer's, for example, probably happening, you know, decades. And some of this maybe 25, 30 years before one starts to have some cognitive decline. So once it's on the radar screen, you know, even multiple factors have probably been at play for for many years. So it didn't just didn't just start yesterday. There's nothing acute about this. So uh, we have to recognize that that's a heavy lift. And up until oh gosh, the last probably eight years, uh, there really you know there were no published studies that ever showed anybody that had an actual Alzheimer's diagnosis that did something. And then it reversed it to the point where they no longer qualified for the diagnosis. So that's it. So, I mean, so expectations are low. Expectations are maybe we can manage this. Maybe we can, you know, in the same way that, the same way that if you had insomnia, you know, caffeine's not going to cure insomnia, but it make you more functional through your day. Um, you know, that, that's kind of where treatment's been. Uh, that's not the most desirable treatment, but that's about the only sort of successes that we've had where at least in some people, some medications um, would make people a little more functional. But we, we, we know that now over the last eh, six, eight years that there are some people that have had an Alzheimer's diagnosis that have improved significantly. Their psych- neuropsychiatric testing has improved. Their imaging has improved. And it's a multifactorial approach. So there's hope there. There's published studies that um, that document that this. Right. Um, they're not randomized controlled trials. They are studies that look at individualized care, where we look at multiple markers of health, and then finding the individual markers that are abnormal in that person, and then addressing those with pre and post and ongoing testing to see what's changing and just both in their whatever those markers are, whether they're thyroid markers or inflammatory markers or whatever the case might be in that individual, and then also checking cognitive markers along the way and, and perhaps imaging as well. We're, we're probably not getting quite to the point where uh, blood biomarkers of dementia itself are being used commonplace at all, but we're getting there. I think we're getting close. Yeah. So there's a, a little bit of what you asked me about. The other part is um, if a person is symptomatic, if they have significant cognitive decline, you have to have, you have to have family buy-in. You have to have them with you, excuse me, with them. They need that support. Uh, it, it's the odds of success I feel are, are minimal without a ton of family support. So that's absolutely key, um, you know, in the same way that, you know, for a, a child to do to do better with dyslexia or, or pick whatever it is, their parents have to buy into that. And and um, I, I don't by any means mean that spouse becomes parent or anything like that. Right. Sometimes sure. it ends up working a little bit that way, but they've got to be on the same team and they've got to be pulling in the same direction um, to make. Uh, to make especially this multifactorial approach work. It doesn't take a team necessarily to get medication into you a couple times a day. That's not that hard to make happen. But unfortunately, at this point, that's not uh, really very effective either. So uh, yeah, those are those are a few thoughts anyway, uh, initially on that, that type of care. Now, you're doing more and more teaching and research on this yourself. Uh, what are kind of the avenues you're doing that in? And uh... And uh, who who are your your people that that would kind of attend one of your lectures? Sure. Then? sure. So the the research group that uh, at least was originally based out of UCLA and led by Dr. Dale Bredesen um, it, it did phenomenal work, and uh, those researchers and others, you know, for a couple of decades were looking at drug development for Alzheimer's disease, and um, and, and it it just has not. Uh, produced any effective uh, drugs really up to this point. Um, and so some of those great minds put their heads together and said, you know what, <laughs> we we are seeing things here that are 
um, that are changeable in some people or in lab animals that are actually levers we should be able to pull to make a difference, but it doesn't work in anything but a small subset or it doesn't work when we start doing it in humans. So maybe a monotherapy is not what we should be looking at. Maybe we should be collaborating and, and trying to figure out, you know, what are the multiplicity of factors that may be causes of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common one, in, in people. And then if we can figure out which of those factors are at play in this person we have in front of us, then we can get them to change. And they've been doing that work um, in the last few years. Uh, Dr. Bredesen and um, and his team have have partnered with a group, a, a formed a group called Apollo Health, and I, that's who I started to work with here the last couple of years with that type of care. So we we try to duplicate that type of care, and other practitioners around the world do. I mean, because the only thing that's been shown to 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 work, at least in some people, right. and there's uh, wonderful evidence for it. The side effects are you get healthier. So, yes. if, you know, uh, you know, so, <laughs> you know, if your cognition um, improves and you get healthier, wonderful. If your cognition doesn't improve, we don't like that. But if it maintains, which nobody predicts with Alzheimer's disease, that it's going to maintain doing really anything. There's a downward slope on this with everybody historically up until quite recently with these approaches. If it maintains, we're, we're quite happy and your health's better, uh, you know, and, and if it, you know, and if it continues to decline, we don't like that. But we also know that your blood sugar is probably under better control. Um, your thyroid's probably under better control. Your sleep's probably better. And, you know, if, if nothing else, um, the progression maybe was looking like, you know, you're going to need to be in a memory care unit or your family member looks like they're going to need to be in that. And, and we don't have a solid crystal ball, but I know when when my mom um, suffered an early onset form of dementia um, 15 years ago, onset in her, uh, when she was my age, uh, oh, earlier, wow. younger than me, actually. And, uh, and so, you know, maybe 20, 25 years ago really was onset. Um, one of the better pieces of advice that I saw, I got from some of the providers that were working with her is, you know, whatever the progression has been in the last three to six months, that's what you should expect in the next three to six months. That's your crystal ball. And so the slope is usually, you know, if it's been going this way, it's probably going to keep going that way. Right. That downward spiral. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can do some things that that slow that and maybe what it looks like is going to be, you know, a pretty high level of disability and uh, probably in a, in a memory care unit somewhere. And we, we slow that progr that progression. I don't mean progress. I mean, progression of disease uh, taking over your life. And that's maybe, you know, flatlined a little bit. And now it's maybe six to 12 months later than what we really thought it was going to happen. It's a lot more time of interacting with your family and, and uh, um, you know, being able to get more out of life and your family getting more of that. And certainly, you know, more time without having to commit those financial resources to that as well. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's been a pretty big deal to me and in my practice for probably about five or six years in the last couple years, especially um, taking on more and more patients that have neurodegenerative disorders and also folks that are like me, that have a you know first order relative that that has these issues, maybe did a little genetic testing like me and found that you know I have a, a higher risk uh, based on some some genes, um, mm -hmm. and so trying to do things that hopefully will prevent and uh, uh, so we, we we work in that in that way as well and um, like I said it's pretty personal all this stuff is but this one is pretty personal to me and so I feel really good about where that's gone in healthcare and, you know, in our clinic, uh, personally, and I hope that it infiltrates, uh, all aspects of healthcare much, much, much profoundly in the next decade. Absolutely. It's almost like prevention's kind of being a swear word out there in in a lot of, a lot of settings. And, uh, we need to get past that because by the time 
long-term research is done on each way to kind of treat things, then uh, our lifespan is is over. They're, they're long-term studies. And uh, uh, so on top of this, we've got the biomarkers, and you mentioned several from lab tests to different neurologic tests that, that we do in clinic. Um, but one thing I've noticed, and uh, we're not quite sure on when it's going to flip or how quickly things can progress, but we can just being trained in observing people and their neurologic uh, performance, uh, we can kind of pick up on subtleties and movements and, and affect and things and go, uh, I think they're kind of on the, on the way to this already. Um, what have you kind of noticed and then also observed kind of progression wise in people? Uh, these subtle little things that when people see them, they're going to know what they are and then be able to kind of monitor that in other people or maybe even themselves. Sure. So that's, that's a great question. And that's really in the front of my mind a lot because, you know, I see a lot of people where I go, man, I wish I could have seen you 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, and amazing, I, you yeah. know we're, and, 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 you know, maybe our conversation now would be significantly different, you know, and, 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 and your ability to interact in your, with the world the way you want to might be different too. But um, a couple things, it health, healthcare um, at large, big problem is that most provider types don't have much time to interact with the folks that they see. Right. And they don't see them very many times. So, um, and it probably a lot of that has to do with reimbursement uh, structures. I mean, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get paid to sit down and shoot the breeze with somebody and really notice their movements, their eyes, you know, whatnot um, for the amount of time. And so uh, one of the reasons why this blends so well with what you and I do, uh, uh, Dr. Hardy, with, with chiropractic care is that chiropractors are used to getting to know their patients and that's nothing yes. new. And that isn't in, that isn't specific to a neurological specialty. It's just oftentimes specific with being kind of a smaller clinic. A lot of chiropractors don't practice in a, most of us don't practice in a big hospital setting. Um, and you know, there's some repetition there. It's not like you're going to give somebody a prescription and say, "Hey, let's see how you do for three months, three months, and then we'll get you back, or we'll do telehealth with you, or you'll check in with the nurse." You know, most of what we do doesn't change lives that way. Uh, it does, you know, with, you know, one-on-one -on -one type interactions that right. help you change your lifestyle and, and, you know, actually physically do, you know, chiropractic adjustments and, and other types of things with people. So, so there's that. Um, I think the other thing is, is which we need is better ways to do research and, and spot these things early. And one of the right. most obvious ones that I see with people um, is Parkinson's, which is a neurodegenerative disorder, you know, very similar to uh, dementias. And so oftentimes it's company with dementia, only it's, you know, fairly specific uh, for degeneration in a small area of the brain that, that makes dopamine. And the disorders of that area and other related disorders in that circuitry, the physical signs become really obvious a long time before a diagnosis is made or before a person feels like, or their, their family feels like, Hey, you know, let's go get you checked out, whatever that. Matters. Right. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's definitely one. Cause I mean, I see it at the grocery store and yes. it's not, you know, that's not, it's, it's not a, a, you know, out in public conversation to really have with someone. So I don't really know quite how to navigate that sometimes in my clinic. I do. In my clinic, I do with with maybe a parent um, where they're not in there to see me. They're there with their kid or um, or maybe they have an adult uh, child with disability. And so a parent that's, you know, 20, 30 years older than their kid happens to be with them. And I may see some things. We've kind of already breached the, you know, uh, uh, a bit of a relationship in that way. So we'll talk about it then. But. But uh, I, I don't know, Doc, I bet, I bet you see that as well. And I would be surprised if Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like things aren't, uh, aren't something that you notice too. 
it's out there. And yeah, it's, it's concerning uh, because, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that could be helped. And uh, on that note, too, how do people find you? Uh, where do you practice um, kind of uh, teaching or lecture or resource wise? Uh, what would be your advice as well? Sure, sure. So um, I practice in Cedar Rapids, Iowa with my wife, yep. Dr. Courtney Shanahan Powell. And, uh, Wonderful lady. We've, yes. We, yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> we've been, she's my chiropractor. And uh, so and we've been in practice here for uh, uh, pretty much the entire time, you know, I've been in, in practice. So 28, 29 years. And uh, so when you can, you can, if you want to, if you want to find our clinic and I see people, I see people in person. But one of the good things that's happened uh, with COVID is that we have a lot more telehealth resources for folks. So even though I may see someone from, you know, eight, 10 hours away or that flies here and I see them a couple of days in a row, then we'll follow up via telehealth, you know, cross right. country or, or, or snowbirds or whatever the case might be. Uh, and so that's that's been good. So it's Powell Chiropractic Clinic and we're in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Dr. Mike Powell. I, I, you know, I don't have great social media resources at all. We have some things on YouTube and, and Facebook that if you, if you dig around a little bit, you can find. Right. And you know, I, I lecture and teach quite a bit, but it actually has been pointed out to me recently, multiple doctors. Um, I was just teaching in North Carolina this last weekend. And actually the weekend before that, I was in Vermont um, teaching. Both times docs came up and said, Hey, I was, you know, I want to see where you're at sometime in the next six months. If it worked out, I wanted to go there, but I, I can't find that. And I said, really? Um, I, I don't have a good spot for you to look. So we may have to, we may have to change that. So, uh, right. Absolutely. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I'm at my clinic and, and, and doing my best to, to help folks and, and help other doctors uh, do what they do even better. So nice. I love it. All right. So if you're in Cedar Rapids, check out Dr. Powell and stay tuned to the next episode of The Hardy Brain, the show that takes athletic, introverted entrepreneurs and leaders and transforms them into ironclad brain performers. Take care.